And um, we just come and, um, and we pray that the Lord is just, it moves in a mighty way this morning, that we would just truly hear from him. And that is our desire each and every week as we come into the sanctuary is that it wouldn't just be routine, that it wouldn't just be something we do each and every week because we come to church on Sunday, but it's an experience where we expect God to meet with us in such a mighty way. And I hope that's your desire as you've come into his presence this morning is we walk into the sanctuary with expectancy, expecting God to speak to us in a mighty way. And so, man, we hope that that's your desire this morning as you come into his presence. And um, we're going to get things started. And we're going to ask the Lord just to bless our service. And the choir is going to lead us. And we're going to begin our worship this morning. So let's go to the Lord in prayer, asking him to bless our service and our time together. Father, we thank you for the privilege that we have to, to come into your presence each and every week. Lord, we don't take it for granted, the opportunity that we have to come in and to celebrate you each and every week. And Lord, I pray that we do that, that we put aside every distraction, everything that may hinder us from truly worshiping you, from truly experiencing your grace. Lord, I pray that we experience your grace and that we truly hear from you and we see what that's like, that, that, that when it shapes who we are, and we become the vessels that you long for us to be. Lord, help us now. And we ask all these things in your son's name. Amen.
sorrows and fears pass away and heartaches soon vanish and burdens can't stay for the heart that's been broken and wounded by sin there is healing when you call on his shall return some glad day a blessed appearing for those who obey every tongue shall confess him to be Lord of Lords they shall bow to the power in his name.
God is able this morning. Amen? He's able. He's lifted up. He's defeated the grave this morning as we come. And listen, if, you're, if you use this Bible app on your iPad or anything else you have, today's verse is very fitting for our series. And, and it's 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 10. It says, And the God of all grace, who called you to his eternal glory in Christ, after you have suffered a little while, will him, himself restore you and make you strong, firm, and steadfast. Amen. I'm so thankful for God's word this morning. Amen. And we celebrate. We come. We come in the presence of our Father, our Savior this morning. We just welcome Him here. We welcome His Spirit here. We are coming to worship the risen King. He is lifted up. He has defeated the grave this morning. And there's no other reason than to worship Him and give Him thanks for Him giving His Son on that cross so long ago. I'm so thankful this morning that I'm able to stand here and worship a risen Savior. A Savior that loved me when I'm unlovable. A Savior that come for somebody that is not worthy of His love. And I'm so thankful this morning as we come as a church, as a body of Christ this morning to worship Him. Let's sing this together. I want to be close, close to your side. So heaven is real, death is a
is the great I am. Amen. You may be seated. Amen. I'm thankful that we can worship um, the great I am this morning and um, that is worthy of our praise and that we can truly celebrate him and, and praise him for all that he's done for us. Uh, man, I, I tell you, I want to start this morning by, by, telling you, by telling you a joke, by telling you a joke. Um, and, and here's the deal. This joke, I practiced it during first service. Um, and so I'm not quite sure, so I'll test it on you too, okay? A guy entered into a bar. I know, I know already what you're thinking. Um, a guy entered into a bar, and, um, and he sits down. And he was alone in the bar. There was a bartender across the room, and that's all that was there. And, um, and he sits down, and, and he begins to say, he, he begins to hear something, and he hears, man, that is a nice tie. Man, that's a nice tie. Guy kind of looked around and noticed that if anybody else was around him and he didn't see anybody. He sees the bartender across the room and he waits a few minutes and then uh, he hears uh, something else. He, Man, I sure love your new haircut. Guy kind of, you know, looks around again. He don't see anyone. You know, he looks kind of this time begins to think a little bit more on it and Let's a little time pass, and he said, man, you know, you must be losing some weight. And about, he said, listen, I've got to ask. So he, he says, Mr. Bartender, uh, I've got a question. I keep hearing things, and, and someone is complimenting me, and I don't see anyone. And, and the bartender looked at him. He said, listen, sir, it's the peanuts. They're complimentary. <laughs> and so uh, I got to thinking this morning, we all have moments where we hear things. We all have moments where we hear um, just these voices, sometimes encouraging, but most of the time discouraging, most of the time defeating, most of the time uh, just words that bring us down in our Christian faith especially, words of you cannot do this, you can't overcome this sin that, that, that is heavy upon you. You, you can't defeat it. You can't serve in a church. Uh, your past is, is in no way God could ever use someone like you. You know, I think when we begin to think about voices, I, I think that many times they're everything but complimentary. They're everything but something that, that, that encourages or lifts us up, but, it, but it's right the opposite. It's, it's telling of discouragement. It's telling of defeat. And man, I think there, there is no better picture of this than the Gospel of John in chapter 8. So if you have your Bibles, I want you to turn with me, if you will, to the book of John, and we're going to look in chapter 8. And while you're turning there, man, I, I've been thinking all week about what this scene must have looked like. Again, thinking about just the dynamics of, 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 man, all the different intricate parts of this story. Read with me, if you will, starting in verse 1 of chapter 8. But Jesus went to, to the Mount of Olives early in the morning, came again to the temple. All the people came to him, and he sat down and he taught them. The scribes and the Pharisees brought, brought a woman who had been caught in adultery and placed her in the midst. And they said to him, teacher... This woman has been caught in the act of adultery. Now, in the law of Moses, commands us to stone such woman. So what do you say? Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, I thank you for your grace. I thank you that it reaches us when we don't deserve it. So, Lord, may it shape us. May we find ourselves worthy of your grace. In your love. I ask all these things in your son's name. Amen. In this story, we, ha we have a lady that is caught in the act of adultery. I began to think of how she must have woke up that morning. As the men entered her room, I'd imagine that she heard, hey, get up out of this bed, you harlot, as they dragged her out of bed. The voices in her 
were voices of defeat, discouragement, sin. I begin to, if you would, take a parade of shame through the middle of the city. As basically they led her or drug her to an early morning Bible study that Jesus was having. Because in essence, that's what it was. Jesus was sitting there and he was teaching a group of followers that had begun to follow Jesus and, and, and listen intently to his teaching. And Jesus begins to instruct them. And, and, and while he's teaching, all of a sudden, these group of religious leaders come and, and they basically drag this woman to, the, the woman to the middle of the scene. And she takes center stage. But I want us to notice Jesus' posture here because I believe it's important. Because we note right away early on that Jesus is sitting teaching. Now, this is very custom of the day. The teachers would sit. They would begin to teach. They would begin to um, basically they're probably sitting on some steps there in the courtyard of the temple, possibly a, a large rock. But we know that Jesus was teaching them. Now, you would think that if Jesus has begun to address this situation, that he would stand and maybe get up on that rock or maybe the highest step and say, here's the deal here. But Jesus doesn't do that. The Bible tells us that he bent down. Or other translations, he stooped down. So picture, if you will, Jesus' posture. We have him sitting and he's teaching in the midst of the early morning. Then all of a sudden, this lady takes center stage. Jesus moves from sitting to stooping. Now, I want us to keep one thing in mind. As Jesus stooped down that morning, as those who accuse that woman... At one point in time, they were all standing looking down at her. But when Jesus stoops, now all those looking about now saw Jesus. Jesus doesn't speak at this point, but rather he does something unusual. He begins to take his finger and kind of mark in the sand. Now, I've never heard this sermon preached or taught where this question wasn't asked. I wonder what Jesus wrote. Truth is, we don't know. Many people speculate. Many people debate. Truth of the matter is, it doesn't matter. But we know that Jesus stoops down to address the situation. Could you imagine the thoughts that are going through that lady's head. Shame, fear, embarrassment, disappointment. Meanwhile, there was a group of church leaders, by the way, that gripped stones. And I could just imagine uh, as they brought this lady to center stage and as Jesus stoops down where she was, that they begin to grip those stones tightly. And I believe that as I picture this scene, I see these men just gripping the stones with all their might saying, now what are you going to do with this lady, Jesus? Because Moses says that we should stone her. Moses commands that, that we stone this lady for what she's done. But what do you say? Jesus says nothing. He simply stoops down and marking on the ground. They insist. Jesus, what are we going to do with this lady? I'll tell you what the law says. The law says that we stone her and that we punish her for this. Jesus gives the reply of all replies. He moves from stooping and he stands. And he simply says this, stoner, but the person without sin, you throw the first one. Wow, what a reply by Jesus. 
If there's ever been a reply, that one was it. John, he, he shares light with us, something that some of the other gospels don't share. And, it, and he says specifically that the older ones were the first to begin to kind of drop their stones. Senior adults, let me just talk with you just for a moment. There has to come a point within the church that our senior adults lead by example. Now, we know that there were religious leaders that were out to trap or trick Jesus, but, but I want us to take note that the older ones that had their stones gripped the tightest, they recognized a need for grace first. I believe that at that point, the voices within this young lady's head began to change a little bit. I believe that they turned to compassion. I believe that they turned to love. I believe they turned to commitment. You see, because she had experienced a stooping Jesus that showed her love. Then, then I, I, I can picture this scene, and, and man, try to imagine, we're in a courtyard this morning, and, and it's just Jesus and probably that lady. There may have been some of Jesus' followers that still were kind of lingering around, but, but I like to picture in my mind just this graveyard of stones laying around at this point. Or they came to the realization that they couldn't throw any stones. Here's my thoughts. I think many times within the church, this concept of grace is removed. I think we're probably closer to the church leaders that are quick to pick up stones and say, let's follow the law because this is the way things are supposed to be. And we fail to recognize and to express and to show grace. One of the reasons that I believe wholeheartedly that our world isn't seeing grace is because we're not showing it within the realms of the church. One of the reasons that I think the world is missing it is because while we should be embracing grace, we're holding stones. You see, the thoughts and the things in her head begin to change, I believe. From embarrassment and shame to I'm not good enough, to failure, to disappointment. To this is what forgiveness is. This is what love is. This is what grace is. You say, well, why, why don't we experience this type of thing? Why don't we see people that embrace grace more often? Now, we know that grace is not something we can give, but it's what the Lord gives. And you say, well, okay, well, how do we display that? Well, we recognize it and we show it and we too embrace it. This scene, his posture here, is unbelievable and it's significant. Because you see, I think we can look at this story and I think we can say, oh man, what an incredible picture of what Jesus did for this young lady. But you see, I think it's so much more, church. Because what we see here is a picture of what Jesus did for us. You see, because here's the honest truth. There was a point that Jesus stooped for you and I. You see, because Jesus was at the right-hand throne of the Father for all of eternity in perfect communion with the Trinity, in perfect fellowship. Genesis 3 happened, and we know that sin entered the world, and they knew that a sacrifice had to be made. And it was part of God's perfect plan to send his son 
Jesus, that he would stoop to the humanity of all of mankind, that he would be this, this perfect sacrifice, this sacrificial lamb for you and I. Listen, that's some incredible stooping, by the way. But if that's not enough, they go to lowly Bethlehem. Nothing good comes from Bethlehem, by the way. Just a dirty place, this Bethlehem. And Jesus stooped there for you and I. He stooped to be born in a stable. He stooped as a lowly position as a carpenter. Not a lawyer, not a doctor, not a profession that brought great wealth. He stooped to touch the hand of a leper with leprosy when everyone else said, unclean, unclean, it's against the law for you to come close to me. Unclean, Jesus stooped to say, listen, I want to touch you so that you may be clean. Listen, if we know Jesus, we have experienced the grace of a stooping Jesus who bent down at one point and another and, and a time in our life and says, listen, I want you to experience what grace looks like. This stooping Jesus went to the cross, by the way. Man, we celebrated what that looks like and we celebrate that and, and we praise that and thankfully he did do that for you and I and that's true. But three days later, Another posture takes place. He stood, church, because he didn't stay laying in a grave anymore. He stood and he walked out of that grave. Just like he stood for her, he stood for us. Because if the resurrection doesn't happen, none of this happens. Christianity doesn't happen. So when he stood in the grave, make no mistake about it, it was him showing us grace just like when he stood for her. There's something amazing about Jesus standing for us, isn't it? There's something amazing and profound about just Jesus stepping to the plate on my behalf. There's another thing I I want us to wrap our heads around if we can. And it's that he speaks on our behalf. You see, because he says, he asked the question at that point to the lady. It's just then, picture the scene, we're in the courtyard again. And he looks at her and he says, "Uh, woman, where are your accusers? Here's the amazing thing about my Jesus. Romans chapter eight, verse 34, it says, who condemns me? Who condemns me? Because I can't be condemned. You know why? Because Jesus intercedes for me. You know know what that's saying? That's a big word for saying Jesus speaks on my behalf before almighty God, by the way. That means that he's standing before almighty God. And let me tell you what's happening is that the devil one day will stand there and say, Stephen, you are rotten. You are no good. Here's your sins. Here's your faults. Here's your failures. Here's your past. Here's your shortcomings. Here's when you didn't have faith. Here's when you didn't trust me. Here's when you allowed to become overcome with your accusers. You know what Jesus says? He speaks up and he intercedes for me. And he says, no way, because I died on the cross for Stephen and I adopted him and I made him my son. And because of of my love, I was the sacrifice for him. You see, that's what he does for us. He speaks for us just like he did her. And so we can look at this story and say, man, he sure was graceful and nice to that lady who really did deserve to be stoned. But church, this is a story for us. This is a story about grace for you and I, that Jesus did the same thing for us. And currently he intercedes for us. You say, well, okay, 
Where do these voices come from? Because man, I get discouraged and I get beat down. And man, I try to do this devotion thing and it just doesn't seem like I can whip it. I I wanna confess this sin. There's this sin that is constantly beating me down and man, I just can't get victory over it. And I wanna get victory over it. Here's the honest truth. I honestly believe most people with hidden sin in their life Did you catch that? The hidden sins, the sins that nobody else knows about, long to bring it before the Lord and have it confessed and have it clean. And you want that in your life. You want that cleansing. You want it to happen, but you can't. You can't for whatever reason. Man, you want to give up that bad habit. You want to give up that sin no matter what it is, and it just doesn't seem like you can whip it. And you know what? There's an accuser that says you can't. There's an accuser that says, you might as well give up on this faith thing. There's an accuser out there that says, your God heals other people, but it won't heal you. How does that make you feel about your loving God? There's an accuser out there that says, I mean, look at the world and we, that we live in. It's a terrible place. People are dying because people are bombing and man, it's a bad place. Can a loving God be orchestrate all of that and begins to put all these doubts and then we begin to doubt him. We begin to doubt his love. We begin to doubt his faith. We begin to doubt who he is with us and we begin to not trust him as much. You say, where does this come from? Well, Revelation chapter 12 says that there was an accuser that comes to earth. Now, this is what I want us to catch because this is very, very important. There is an accuser, Satan himself, that is accusing us, you and I. You say, well, Satan does that? Absolutely. Absolutely. And he does his very best to discourage us, to defeat us. And it goes in so many different forms, it's unbelievable. I believe he uses demons. I believe there's an element of it. I believe he uses sometimes our friends. I believe he uses our employer at times. I believe he discourages us. He beats us down and he says that we can't do this. We cannot win. We cannot be successful. And you know what? A lot of people are listening and saying, he's right. He's right. The white flag is out, my friends, because I can't do this. I can't be a disciple. The costs are too high. I can't do it. I give up. I quit. I quit and we become overcome and we we get overwhelmed with shame, guilt, and man, just this, we never really have victory. I want you to listen to me this morning. The Lord wants you to have victory. You hear me? The Lord wants us to be victorious. This accuser, it will continue to accuse you. He will continue to do that. That will continually happen. It will happen over and over and over again. Now, here's how we deal with it. Is we say, listen, Mr. Accuser, my Jesus paid this debt. I believe without a doubt, the past of a lot of believers still, still are keeping them from all they can be for Christ. That they say, man, listen, the Lord can't use me because what I've come from. The Lord can't use me. Listen, the Apostle Paul used to kill Christians and he went on to be one of the world's greatest missionary. He can use you. He can use you. And I don't give that example to say, oh, that's just a Bible example. He's not a real person. Oh, but he is. Just somebody that was transformed by grace. And here's the cool thing. He wants to transform us by grace. He wants to take this grace, this element of a stooping Jesus and say, transform us and to shape us into everything he wants us to be. And that's what makes it amazing, by the way. That's what makes it unbelievable. It's because this lady deserves stones. Honest. That's what she deserved. And yet Jesus had the reply of all replies and found grace. You say, okay, I get it. There's an accuser that accuses me. And there's a God that sent his son to stoop for me. 
You see, I, I think there's a constant battle in the life of a believer. I think there's a constant uh, battle to, of, of just, just right and evil. Make no mistake about it, man. There is an element of this that is spiritual warfare. And for some of us, man, all that is is just a nice way of saying that the devil is out to get us. And man, there has a lot been made light of the devil. Listen, the devil is real. And he accuses us. And his goal is to keep us from a relationship with Christ. And if he can tell you that you're not good enough to have this type of grace. If he can tell you that, 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 man, you can never live for him fully. If he can tell you that, man, you can't do your devotions and you stop doing them. If he can tell you not to be faithful because it doesn't really matter and you stop, he will do it. He will do it. I'm telling you, he will do it. If he can discourage you to the point where you will quit, he will do so. And that, my friends, is spiritual warfare and it is real. It is real as I'm standing before you that it is real and he wants to do that. He wants to attack us. He's attacking homes. He's attacking families. He's attacking individuals. And he's doing it through various ways and, and resources. You say, well, how do we respond? How do we respond? How, how do, how do, how, what do we do? The way we respond is the same way she did, humbly. Standing before Jesus saying, where are your accusers? You see, I believe that the Lord is looking at each and every one of us who, who, who may say, Lord, I don't know that you can use me. Man, I, I, think about, I think about Moses all the time. I think about just him going before the Lord and him saying, Lord, I, I want you to lead the children of Israel. Man, I want you to lead them to the promised land. Do it, Moses. You can do this. I'm calling you. Go for it. What does Moses do? He's like, Lord, I don't know. I don't really speak that good. I'm telling you, man, I got all kinds of issues. I get tied up and I stutter sometimes and I talk with a list sometimes. And I mean, I just don't know that I can do this. And he begins to make all these excuses of why God can't use them. Man, we do that, don't we? We do that. And man, I'm telling you, the Lord uses excuses within the church, by the way, of why we don't do what he wants us to do. And man, you know what I think about when I think about Moses? What God could have done with Moses and what Moses missed out on because God had to use Aaron to help him. Isn't it a different story if Moses says, well, Lord, if you say I can do it, I don't think I can speak that good, but I trust you, so I'm, I'm after it. That's a different story. But God has to bring Aaron along and say, Aaron, you're going to have to speak for Moses because he's a wimp. Man, I think if we're honest, that's probably what the Lord would say to many of us. Man, I could use them in such a, a tremendous way, but they're just wimps. They're defeated. They're broken. They, they, they don't think they can make it. They, they're overwhelmed with discouragement. And man, this discouragement is real. The, 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 the devil is using, that the accuser is using to defeat families, to defeat church members, to defeat the life of a Christian. He is doing it. And he's doing it every single day. That doesn't go away. How we change it is we rely upon his grace. And we say, Lord, you sent Jesus to the cross so that I didn't have to deal with this anymore. I no longer have a muddy past. I no longer have to be discouraged. I can have victory because I have experienced your grace and your forgiveness. You see, that's where everything changes. That's when it begins to shape us. That's when things go different is when we say, hey, I've been changed by his grace. So it doesn't matter what you say. It doesn't matter what you do because, man, the accuser isn't going to get to me because, man, my life has been transformed. It's been shaped and I'm forever different because of grace. That's what makes me different. It's not because of what I've done. It's not because of what I can do. You see, because she could do nothing. She could do absolutely nothing. Have you thought about that? Because she can't do anything. What is she going to say? It wasn't me, really. I didn't do it. They caught her in the act. What could she say? Could she appeal it to the religious leaders? No, because they were holding stones. You see, it wasn't of herself to deliver grace. She couldn't do anything, just like we can't without grace. We're in the same boat she was. Where we say, listen, Lord, we can't do anything but your grace. So we say, Lord, it's time that I, I stop being overwhelmed with discouragement. 
it's time that I stop being defeated. Enough of me being defeated. Mr. Accuser, it's time that you stop using my past and and my past mistakes and my past life against me because I've experienced grace. You see, I think there are many things, there are many voices that tell us we can't, that we can't love him, that we can't serve him, that we're unworthy to, and we are. Those are true voices. We can't do anything just like she couldn't put. Oh, but it's because of what Jesus did for you and I that enables us to do it. So what do we do? You see, when I think about this lady, we see a change in heart. I would love to know what happened to this lady after that day. Because in my heart of hearts, this lady was forever different. You say, why do you think that? Because when people are transformed by the grace of God, they are forever different. You say, well, how do you know that, preacher? Because he transformed me. And it was only his grace. And here's the good news. He longs for you to have victory. He's not sitting with a stone waiting for you to make mistakes. He's waiting to embrace you and show you what grace really looks like. Let's stand for prayer. Lord, as Josh comes, I get overwhelmed when I think about your grace. I get overwhelmed. I get taken back by it. I I don't understand it. I can't comprehend it. But Lord, you created me to have victory over the accuser. You created me in order that I may too experience the same grace she did. Lord, you want me to have victory. Lord, I'm thankful that there was a day that you stooped down and you made a way for Stephen. I'm thankful that you stood for me and I'm thankful that you speak for me. Because Lord, I'm not perfect. But Lord, I know that one day I'm gonna stand before you and the devil is gonna point out everything that I've always done wrong. And he's going to say, Stephen, you are this and you are this and you've sinned here and you sinned there. And what's going to happen next is unbelievable because Jesus is going to step forward. And he's going to say, oh, that's true. Oh, that's true. But Father, I gave my life for Stephen. My blood was shed so he could be cleansed. And when we experience that, it's just like her when she got up that day and she would forever be different because of grace. So Lord, uh, as we worship you, maybe, just maybe, there's someone here this morning that says, Thank you for your grace, Pastor. Thank you for your grace, Lord. I want to be a testimony of your grace. So here I am. Because you speak for me to all God Almighty. You do that for me. Not because I deserve it. Not because I'm this or not because I'm that. But because you are God. And you love me enough to give me grace. Or maybe for so long... You've played the blame game and the accuser says, this is your fault. This is your fault. You were a failure. 
You weren't able to accomplish what you set out to do. Sure, you invited your friends, but they didn't come. Failure. And you've told yourself that you are a failure. And listen, listen to me. That ends now because Jesus says, here is my grace. Here it is. Here it is. Where are your accusers? He's saying that to you this morning. And man, may we worship him to say, Lord, thank you. Thank you for removing the accuser from my life because you gave me grace. So Lord, as Josh leads us in a time of worship, man, this altar is open and may it change us. May we come to an altar and say, Lord, I'm receiving and accepting your grace.